Hey folks, Daryl here with a quick preamble letting you know that there was so much soccer action this weekend that we've split it up into two parts. This is part one, the European side. We're going to talk Christian Pulisic, um, other Americans in the Bundesliga, English Premier League, including, of course, that Jordan Henderson goal. If you're looking for our MLS review, especially Toronto versus New York, that's going to be in part two. That will be the next episode in our feed. Hello and welcome to the Monday Total Soccer Show. I am Daryl Grove and I'm joined by a man who, much like Christian Pulisic, tore it up this weekend. It's Taylor Rockwell. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I like the, the double entendre, the double meaning. The, uh-huh. I guess that's a pun. Does it that qualify is. as a pun? Yeah. So tour is German for goal. And young Christian Pulisic scored for Borussia Dortmund this oh, weekend. No, he did. He did. But I just found myself asking, was that a pun? Which reminds me of Mac from Always Sunny, never knowing what a pun is. <laughs> <laughs> so he just keeps trying and missing every single time. I don't know what German for assist is, but Christian Pulisic also got two assists. Assist ball. Let's say no. In Dortmund's <laughs> 6 0 win over yep. Darmstadt. We're going to be looking at that Christian Pulisic performance. How can we not? Everybody here in the United States, I mean, literally everybody, mm-hmm. it's, all, it's all anybody's talking about. They've forgotten the election. Mm-hmm. Everyone's talking about Christian Pulisic and his goal and two assists for Dortmund. We're also going to be talking about Aaron Johansson, who had a more mixed bag of a weekend than Christian yeah, Pulisic. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> in the, uh, the Arjo F. Joe derby, as we call it. No one else calls it that. We do. No one else does. And, of course, we're going to talk Premier League with a special focus on... Watford 3, Manchester United 1. Hooray, yeah. says the Man United fan. Sorry, Tyler. That's all good. It'll be fun. There'll be some Watford fans who are very happy to hear that. This is true. <laughs> I know one of them. So, yep, I think you're correct. Shall we start with young Mr. Christian Pulisic, who is now 18 years old. It was recently his birthday. Let us um, do. And it's worth noting that Dortmund started with Christian Pulisic today, as they did in the uh, Champions League tie earlier yeah. this week. So, okay, here's an interesting question. Um, for this game against Darmstadt, mm. Dortmund rested Obama Yang and Goetze and Schürrle and some really big names, right? I'd add the the inclusion that it might be, I don't know this for sure, we probably could have checked this before we started recording, that Schürrle is injured, oh, okay. since he didn't feature in that Champions League game, as far as I can recall, okay. either. So well, it might be that he's maybe not quite fit. Okay, well, you'll, you'll grant me at least that they rested mm-hmm. Goetze and Obama Young, who yep. are two of their big name attackers for this game yeah. against Darmstadt. So my question is, did Christian Pulisic, with his good performance in midweek in the Champions League, um, earn a starting spot this weekend or did he get one by virtue of other players being rested I think he earned it because if if it were by virtue of other players being rested then you might say well Emery Moore didn't start in that uh, Champions League game so maybe yeah. Pulisic did maybe you give him a rest and you start Emery Moore so I think it was more for Thomas Tuchel that he, he said yeah it was a good game let's start you and Dembele see if you guys can continue to do pacey wingery things oh, they certainly did yes um, so if anyone listened to our show um, after the um, Champions League game um, we picked up on some things that maybe Pulisic mm-hmm. did well, but also some things he didn't do so well. Yeah. What was the, uh, would you remind our listeners, Taylor, what was the main thing that we thought might be one of the things holding Pulisic back mm-hmm. in terms of guaranteeing a first team spot? It was basically delivery from the wing, like at the touchline. Yep. Because for uh, Dortmund in that Champions League game and when he was playing with the United States national team most recently, yeah. it was a lot of driven balls across the box that sometimes came off and led to beautiful goals. Mm, like but one in most, seven. Yeah, but most of the time went through and produced big red arrows when yeah. you're looking at it statistically. And in the Champions League game, we saw his teammates visibly frustrated yep. with a couple of those low-driven balls because they wanted the ball to feet, not just fired in and fingers crossed. Right, because right? even, even then it wasn't even just that they wanted it crossed. It was that they wanted it squared or they wanted to pick his head up and try yeah. to find the open passing options. And he didn't quite do that as maybe often as his team or coach would have liked. And did he do it against Darmstadt? He sure did. He did, didn't he? He sure did. We he even, did the good thing, to clarify. Yes. He did the good thing, not the bad thing. <laughs> we even checked his passing chart, right? There were very, I think there were only two red arrows in the box, which are therefore incomplete passes. I think he was five for eight, unfortunately. But yes, otherwise, a very good performance <laughs> over. Well, two of those were assists, right? Yeah, and one of them, and well, yes, and one of them was a cross that was headed clear that went back to him that he then travelled in for an assist. Yes. So we'll take that too. <laughs> well, should we start with his goal? Because yep. the first thing that Pulisic does in the second half is score a goal coming in from the right mm-hmm. touchline. And in fact, I want to talk about that. Yeah, there's a weird, not a weird, but an interesting Borussia Dortmund tactic. <laughs> yeah, when they're all, I know you love it. When they're all up on a team, yep. Pulisic really does like 
get chalk on mm-hmm. his boots. If the, yeah. It's paint, really, isn't it? He gets paint on his cleats yeah. uh, out on the right. And Dembele on the left wing will go all the way out wide. And they will absolutely stretch teams out. Right, because it, it, it gives you an immediate constant option yep. that you can drop the ball back to your center midfielder who's holding he can pick his head up and play that long ball or he can play it to the outside back who mm-hmm. then play it to that winger who's now wide open and then Darmstadt either have to stretch themselves mm-hmm. out to mark both guys or they have to go compact and leave one side open or stretch uh, Dembele's jersey one or the other <laughs> <laughs> that was ridiculous that was a 10 yard just he, I forget who the defender was for Darmstadt he got a yellow for it yeah. but he really did just go for a ride and <laughs> just hold Dembele for a good long while uh, so you can do that like, as well he was like Marty McFly early mm-hmm. in Back to the Future where he, uh, he's on his skateboard and hangs onto the back of the truck. Yep, exactly like that. <laughs> um, no hoverboard, though, unfortunately. Uh, but I would say, weirdly, that the goal from Pulisic is maybe the least impressive thing that he does in oh, terms really? of the impressive things that he does in this okay. game. Yeah, because it, it is just that he's really at far wide. Mm-hmm. He makes the run inside, and it's a fortuitous goal, essentially, because I think Dortmund are trying to get a shot off, yeah. and then a Darmstadt defender comes through and toe pokes the ball clear, yeah. but he toe pokes it wide right to the path of Christian Pulisic, uh-huh. who then comes in and finishes it with the instep. Yep, left-footed instep from the right-hand side. I mean, yep. it's a it's a good finish, but I think you're right. It is the least impressive thing, because yeah. I think the most impressive thing mm-hmm. um, is that we saw Pulisic cross, mm-hmm. right? And like you said, the, set, the uh, assist that he gets, the first assist, yep. first it's a cross that's cleared out, comes back to and him. it's a good cross. It's it put, is a good it's cross. It's put to the mixer, but like far enough away that the goalkeeper can't really get it cleanly, yeah. that people can contest it. So it's a good ball in. And then Pulisic gets it, squares up to the defender, mm-hmm. and hits it sort of, what, outside of the foot, Jordan Morris, Travella style? Yep. Through the legs of the defender, into the path of Castro. Mm-hmm. Who then does the reverse flick, like yeah. reverse instep flick. Two, they did that twice in this game, Dortmund. <laughs> so well done to them. Well done to them indeed. <laughs> but yeah, it's a really good, because that's the difference, right? It's not just that he's crossing the ball. We saw him do that for the second assist he got mm-hmm. for Emre Moore. It's a good cross. But in this situation, it's that he did what we didn't see him do in the Champions League. He picks his head up. He spots the runner. He plays a very well-weighted mm-hmm. and a specific ball. He uses the Travella for a reason, not just because, like, oh, I don't want to hit it with my weaker foot, yeah, but yeah. it's because he knows he can get that bend around the first defender into the path of Castro, and that's exactly what he does. And then the third, mm-hmm. well, I want to say the third involvement of Pulisic, mm-hmm. the third time he scores points in an American yep. sense, is um, he goes down the right wing. Um, I think he sort of evades a defender, gets the touchline, Chips it up to the far mm-hmm. post where Emre Moore, who has come off, off the bench, uh, comes and meets it. Great touch from Moore to control yep. it and then finish. Mm-hmm. It is a nice cross, but we noticed Pulisic doesn't look up at all. He does not. He, he basically beats his guy, gets to the end line, and then does like the chipped looping ball to the back post. Yeah, that ball drops suddenly, right? And Which I is, have no problem with that, to be honest. It's a nice bit of scar. I'm a little concerned by the idea that he didn't look at all. He just basically chipped it and hoped that someone was at the back post? Well, it, I guess it depends, because you could say he chipped and hoped, in which case, yeah, it's probably yeah. not the best then, thing. Isn't this just an, like a, a, more, a higher altitude version of the low-driven ball, yeah. if you just chip and hope? If that's what he was doing. Right. But if it's that they've practiced, get to the end line, he's inside the penalty box, so it's not a loop, like it's not a long cross into the box, it's he's inside, he's inside the penalty area, gets to the end line, and then it's essentially just knock it to the back post. Someone's going to be trained to be there. That's why we have Emery Moore now out on the wing who can come inside as Pulisic did for his first goal. Yeah. Now Emery Moore does the same thing. So maybe it's a Dortmund um, pattern of play yeah. that any time the ball comes into the box, then the wing, the opposite winger comes mm-hmm. to the far post. Yes. Right? Yeah. But this is also a game when we saw uh, Pulisic make someone fall. He made yeah. he made uh, Sirigu. The, With the, yeah, the, uh, yeah. I'm going right. No, I'm yeah. going left. And Sirigu's like, oh, I'm going down. We saw him <laughs> have to be fouled because he basically had made a really smart run and he got blocked off the ball. No yeah. foul given, but it was clearly a foul because basically no defender was tracking him. Well, this so was Dortmund's steps across. This is Dortmund's first goal, and that's the beginning of Dortmund's first yeah. goal. The rest mm-hmm. of that play develops. Like, I've forgotten who scores. I think it was Ramos, maybe. Uh, but yeah, Pulisic's sure. dribble is the start of that goal. Yeah, I mean, and so it was a really impressive game. I think overall, he did lots of good things. Strangely, one of my favorite things, though, that I was noticing is that after uh, Pulisic's goal and after Emery Moore's goal. All of the youngsters are yes. hugging. And it, and Trust and you the, to spot this. And at the time, it made me happy just because it's like, oh, look who comes. Like he, but when Pulisic scores, it's kind of a routine goal. The commentator was more or less like, oh, yeah, it's done and dusted this game. There's no way Darmstadt are doing anything, uh-huh. even though that only made it 2-0. And the veteran players for Dortmund were sort of like, yeah, whatever, and did their, like, yeah, good job, kid. And he ran past them, and then Dembele comes streaking in, and Felix Postelot comes streaking in, and there's a huge teenage hug behind the goal. <laughs> is, right? Same thing when Emery Moore scores. It's Postelot, Pulisic, and yep. Emery Moore. And what that speaks to is 
at first I was just like, oh, they're, they're buddies. And what I realized, though, is that if you've ever been in a competition for a spot, that's not what you do. You're sort of like Emery Moore scores, and you're like, no, that's not good. Yeah, and each time Moore mm-hmm. did something incredible, I yeah. was a little bit like, oh, that's a threat to Pulisic. Yeah, Even the wasn't. assist and for the goal, yeah. I'm like, oh, Moore, that's something good. Right, but what it speaks to is like harmony within the ranks because they're all celebrating. They all seem genuinely enthusiastically happy for each other when good things happen. Yeah. So – it almost makes me happier that, like, yes, these teenagers can all do really good things. It's not just the American doing them, and it doesn't just have to be the American doing them because it <laughs> seems like everybody is pretty happy with what's going on at Dortmund. And bigger picture, speaking mm-hmm. of what's going on at Dortmund, we noticed, I mean, there were, what, four teenagers on the field. There's Felix Paslak at right back, a member mm-hmm. of the Total Sock Show's Getting Network. Yep. Um, Emre Moore um, came on. They're all members of the Total Sock Show's Getting yeah, Network. Okay. Yeah. Emre Moore came on. Usman Dembele mm-hmm. is 19. Yep. And uh, Christian Pulisic. Yep. That's four teenagers in one team, plus some other young guys, right? Julian Weigel, we looked was what 21 yeah we also R- learned how to pronounce that properly so that's yeah. nice mm-hmm. <laughs> thank you to the gentleman who's doing the uh, <laughs> yeah. fuck sucker to go coverage yep. um rafael guerrero um you're a 2016 winner mm-hmm. only 22 this is a young dortmund team yes i know mm-hmm. this isn't like headline news but yeah. it's worth underscoring that the team that's probably going to challenge Bayern for the title this mm-hmm. year is a young team it's a young team with lots of strength across the field and a very deep team as well that i think we're going to see big things from and i'm very excited for that first uh Bayern Dortmund game. Yeah, I was just actually, I was just looking at my phone ahead to the future here. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons I think that some players were rested is that Dortmund play again on Tuesday. They are away to Wolfsburg this Tuesday. Okay. So that All would right. be interesting to see does Christian Pulisic maintain his spot in the lineup? I'm thinking probably not if he's uh, played yeah. Saturday and then Tuesday. And then the following well, weekend. If, if he's played, what, Wednesday, then Saturday, it seems yeah. unlikely that he's then going to play Tuesday. It is probably too much, right? And then the following Friday, it's Dortmund versus Freiburg. Hmm. So that, right. could be, that could be when we see, does he get back yep. in the lineup? We shall see. And play at the Westfalen Stadium, he said, taking a guess. <laughs> sure, <laughs> why not? <laughs> Should we talk other Americans in the Bundesliga? Um, Quick check-in on Julian Green. Julian Green sat on the bench yep. as by Munich won. Mm-hmm. Watched some very good players play, but did not see any action. No, Worth noting, watched some very good players sub on as well. I forget <laughs> who they were, but I'm, I know Boateng was in there. I know Thiago was in there. Yeah. I forget the third. I think oh, it was wait, Douglas Costa. It was Douglas Costa, <laughs> right. So you kind of understand why. Like, I think I'd be okay if I were the fourth best player out of those four. Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure I am the fourth best player out of those. The, he might be the seventh best player <laughs> on the bench. But just um, a reminder, the reason we think he's going to get some minutes yeah. is uh, Robert Lewandowski is the go-to striker, obviously, at Bayern, as yeah. he would be almost anywhere, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and but Julian Green is the sort of only other guy that like could regularly play centre forward. Thomas Müller will maybe play there yeah. for big games, but we think Julian Green will get some minutes off the bench. Mm-hmm. We're just waiting for it to actually happen. Yeah. We're just waiting for it to actually happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, weirdly, even with everything we've talked about with Pulisic, even with Fabian Johnson getting an assist, Aaron Johansson getting an assist as well, not the greatest week in the Bundesliga for Americans. Why because is that? we talked about Julian Green didn't play. Yeah. Uh, John Brooks out with injury. Mm-hmm. And then if we get to the Fab Joe Arjo Darby, <laughs> a decent game for Fabian Johnson. He gets the assist. His team wins 4-1. to one. Yep. Aaron Johansson doesn't start, comes on at halftime, has a beautiful assist for uh, Bremen's Search only memory. goal. Yep. Yeah. And then gets a red card. Should we talk about Fabian Johnson first? Let's the, do that. The winner of the Fab Joe Arjo yep. derby for Borussia mm-hmm. Mönchengladbach. So he essentially played sort of, um, I want to call it left midfield or left wing back, depending on what you think Borussia Mönchengladbach yeah. are doing. But he ends up very far forward, mm-hmm. right? So um, it's, uh, oh, it's Eden Hazard's brother, mm-hmm. uh, Torgan Hazard. Torgan. Is, I believe, how we're supposed to pronounce it. It is a very nice uh, setup from Fabian Johnson. There's a ball sort of fired slightly ahead of him. I'm not sure who mm-hmm. by. And he kind of kills it in the air, takes it forward, and then uh, I think you said it was a much better pass than you realized on first watch when he puts yeah. it into the path of Torgan Hazard for the assist. Because it looks like he slows up and maybe could play it sooner and then stumbles a little bit, and mm-hmm. then he plays the ball, but it still gets to Hazard, and Hazard finishes first time. If you watch it from the alternate angle, it's basically he's this is switching This is first goal if mm-hmm. he was looking for it. And he's switching it to his dominant foot so he can play with his right foot. Mm -hmm. But he's doing that because he's figured out that he has the time to do so. And that Hazard, he's recognized, has made a smart enough run that he's not going offside. He's holding with that line. And so Fabian Johnson can then take his time, really play the ball he wants to play, and then let Hazard get through and smash it home first time. And it's a lovely finish. And also, if you use your right foot from Mm -hmm. the left, then you can bend it into the path. Of Torgan Hazard. Yeah, which right? I, think he, I think he doesn't even bend it that much. I think it's just that he weights it really, really well. Right. So he splits the defenders but puts it right into his path, onto his dominant foot so he can finish first time. So Fabian Johnson would be great at skee-ball. 
Yes. Because you can weigh those balls really well. Or shuffleboard, too, I think. Yeah, but yeah. Oh, you're a shuffleboard <laughs> aficionado. Evidently. I don't quite remember playing it, but sure. <laughs> I can confirm that you are. <laughs> and then to Arjo. Yep. Um, so Arjo doesn't start, which I think is okay, because he only started the season because everybody else was more injured than he was. Mm-hmm. Right? He was just coming back from, I believe, a hip injury. Yep. So he doesn't start this game. He comes on, I don't know if he comes on at half time, but he's definitely on the field in the second half. As I recall, the stat was uh, 46 minutes sub done, which usually that means, means half-time. unless they wanted to give him one extra minute, uh, <laughs> he came on for Fritz. Okay. Yeah. So he is up front. He's the mm. farthest forward striker for Werder Bremen, but he does the smart thing and comes deep to get the ball. Yep. Wonderful first touch and turn. It's almost like a little spin turn, right, with his mm-hmm. left foot. And then he scoops it over the Borussia Mönchengladbach defense for Serge Gnabry to run on and smash one of the best volleys I've ever seen. It's real pretty. It's real pretty because yeah. he hits it in stride perfectly. And, I mean, it's not like he hits it to the top right corner. Like, he just smashes it past the goalkeeper. Yeah. And it does get up and down real fast, which is why the keeper struggles to handle it. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a beautiful goal. That said, it's a consolation goal because it then makes it 4-1 to one at yeah, that point. Yeah, and that's how it stays. Mm-hmm. Can't you say, I usually am a hater of that scoop pass because mm-hmm. it takes all the pace off the ball. Yeah. So I think I'm weirdly more impressed that Arjo pulled it off because I, it's a pass that never, or almost never works. I guess never say never because it just worked this weekend. Yeah, well, yeah, you can't use a modifier with an absolute, Daryl. <laughs> Clearly, you've never taught SATs. Uh, but, but I think it's especially impressive because what it says to me is that Johansson knows what Gnabry's all about, right? Yeah. Because it's, it comes from a position that he's, what, like maybe 35 yards from goal when he scoops it? So yeah. he knows because Gnabry hits it from the top of the box. Mm-hmm. So I think he recognizes. So this, he's made 17 yards. This is, the way, this is the way I'm going to be able to play the ball over the top. But I'm also aware that Serge, as his name suggests, is quite quick. And so that's how we can break that back line because I can't play a through ball. Yeah. The keeper will collect it. But if I scoop it over, that's what allows him to run onto it and get to it in time. Yeah. So I think it's a very intelligent pass yep. from Johansson. Maybe not a very intelligent reaction to perceived as getting fouled. Yes. Mm-hmm. So um, in the 80th minute... Arjo mm. leaves the field, um, <laughs> not, not, not for not a foul, yeah. not for anything like that is involved in the run of play. I think for just yelling at the referee. Twice would be Expeating my guess. Expeating at the referee. Yes, because <laughs> he thinks that uh, Mahmoud Daoud... Another, another member of the Tulsa Show Scouting Network. Yeah, they, they, were, they were out in force this yeah. weekend. Um, I think basically Daoud backs up into him and kind of bodies him off with his mm-hmm. butt. And so I guess Johansson thinks that he's been fouled, no foul given, yells right there then does that 20 yard sprint where I think we both watched it we both thought it was going to be like a retaliatory foul that I was, was going to earn the red for a, like horror two footed flying tackle from Johansson on Dohu right and he gets about even with the official and the official stops play turns and immediately just dishes out the red card yeah and so I'm guessing it was maybe a couple different expletives or something mm-hmm. particularly bad or it was just a weak red card that's also a possibility we tried lip reading right mm-hmm. and we couldn't tell was it American yeah uh, well which I mean English mm-hmm. <laughs> or was it German was it Icelandic yeah we don't know it was just his mouth was uh, very wide and Dutch loud. could have been Dutch as well who knows yeah <laughs> so, oh because he played for us yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we don't know what he said but we do know that the referee did not like it mm-hmm. I think Johansson looks shocked right but mm-hmm. isn't this like part of the whole protecting referees thing that yeah. you cannot show dissent to referees mm-hmm. you can't be aggressive towards referees I think he's learned that lesson the hard way yep yeah I mean definitely the hard way because he was absolutely shocked yeah and even even like you could see like thought it was questionable that he even deserved a card and then when he saw the shade of that card mm-hmm. was definitely not pleased this also is a bad thing for his u.s men's national team chances oh it's right? a bad thing period for him right yeah because yeah, he's obviously going to be suspended and out of that Werder bremen mm-hmm. team but he's going to be suspended in the build-up essentially now to those sort of um yep. early to mid october friendlies that the u.s has yep. right he's going to be absolutely unavailable for mm-hmm. those although i can't remember a european player is going to be playing in those anyway I think I think, that, I think it corresponds. It's a FIFA date, right? Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Johansson, if he is selected for that, he'll be selected on the back of at least not playing for a couple of weeks. Well, so I think it's a no-no. I, guess I think it makes the decision easy for Klinsmann. As long as Hamburg players continue to refuse to pass to Bobby Wood, it seems, <laughs> then maybe maybe options are still available for Aaron Johansson. Yeah, we saw that passing chart. I'm sorry, yeah. I've forgotten who um, CC'd us on mm-hmm. that tweet. But yeah, there's a passing chart of Hamburg as they lost to Lawn Ball Sports Leipzig, <laughs> yeah. uh, where no player passed to Bobby Wood, it seemed like. Not great. Or at least there were no, no like strong connecting lines. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he re- received very little service up front for To Hamburg. be fair, from what I understand, that's more a condemnation of Hamburg's 
kind of lack of a consistent attacking plan that it oh, is yeah, yeah. Bobby Wood smells funny or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Although we can neither confirm nor deny that Bobby yeah, Wood smells funny. We can't. I mean, it was it was the Meta World piece. I feel like I reference him way more often than I should. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was his strategy to never shower before games so he'd smell bad and people wouldn't want to defend him. Is that right? So, so maybe, maybe, maybe some players do do that. Who knows? Did that ever work? I probably. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'd want to get too close to a dude who is stinking <laughs> and also is Meta World piece who might go into the crowd and punch people in the face. Do you know what else stunk? His Key and Peele segments. Who? Meta World Peace. Oh, I didn't see any of those. He did like a news with Meta World. I didn't, I didn't like those. I do love Key and Peele. I guess that's a side note. Weirdly, I was watching them. I was watching clips of them today. I was watching the one of uh, where one of them is uh, on, our big boy and one of them is Andre 3000. <laughs> <laughs> and Andre 3000 is just, you know, as insane as you'd expect him to be. Key and Peele, good stuff. Shall we move um, a little north to the English Premier League? Why does your breath smell like birdseed? <laughs> Well, that's one of the questions that will be asked of Jose Mourinho <laughs> this week. Is it? So Manchester United lost 3-1 um, at Watford. Yep. It's Mourinho's third consecutive defeat mm-hmm. as Manchester United manager. I believe it was uh, Watford's first win over Man United in something like three decades. Correct. Uh, which is a misleading stat, right? Because mostly they've not been in the same division. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But still, win's a win. History's history. So it's, it seems as if everything was going great for Mourinho at mm-hmm. Old Trafford, right? We talked a couple of times about how the swagger was back and there's Zlatan and there's Pogba yep. and this new defensive midfield coupling was working. And I was even kind of excited about Wayne Rooney playing attacking midfield. Yeah. Um, after that Man City derby, the Manchester derby defeat, mm-hmm. um, there was the loss to Feyenoord away mm-hmm. in the Europa League. And now there's this loss to Watford. Right. Is it as bad as people seem to think? Uh, I guess... I'm going to go Clinton here. Depends on what your definition of it is. <laughs> um, Manchester United slide. Is there sort of a thing? Is there, is there some major thing that needs fixing in the Manchester United team yeah, based on so. the last few games? I think so. Yeah. I think it seems like Mourinho still doesn't quite know who his best players are in what positions. I think he also still isn't sure what he wants to do with certain personalities, namely the aforementioned Wayne Rooney. Mm-hmm. And so with that comes kind of experimenting but generally relying on players to get things done and then when they haven't gotten them done you kind of leave leave yourself out there and I think that's what happened in this game I would quibble with that in that one of the problems seems to be that he has stuck with Mm -hmm. Ron Fellaini and Paul Pogba as his two deep midfielders Yeah, and I think it was clearly a problem against Manchester City Mm -hmm. Um, as we discussed these goals I would argue it was clearly a problem against Watford that's a thing that did not work against Watford it's one thing for it to not work against a rampant Kevin Mm -hmm. De Bruyne yeah, well, it's partly to blame for a rampant game. But, but I think if you look at other aspects of it, and you're right to a certain extent with some of those players, but then you have like Morgan Schneiderlin starting at times. You have it looks like Daley Blint has been dropped because of his performances for, against Man City. Yeah. Sometimes you have Under Herrera come in and play defensive midfield. So it just seems like he's still kind of experimenting with pieces when there's I feel like a larger problem. Like he's fixing little tiny bits of the car that needs a massive overhaul. Yeah. Shall we go through? the goals sure. that they conceded because mm-hmm. I would say um, so I'm a, I know you're a Manchester United fan yeah. I'm a, a neutral completely right. for Watford Manchester United that first goal Capu's first goal for Watford Martial is absolutely fouled is uh, absolutely sure? fouled by Britta because both the commentators yeah. say no foul they did well I think um, <laughs> they amend it once they see the think, slow-mo replay from the alternate I think angle. Peter Drury was uh, changing his yeah. mind uh, David Pleat was not interested in changing his mind yeah, yeah so the, the way this works is the ball is cleared out sort of to the side right mm-hmm. Martial goes to collect it um, he's got uh, Daryl Yamat closing down on him he doesn't really have any options right because right. Luke Shaw and Paul Pogba have uh, overrun overrun yeah. gone ahead and then Brutus comes in from the side. I believe Martial can't see him. Yeah. And pretty much cleans him out, right? Well, basically, Martial cuts back and I think is keeping an eye on Janmat, who's yeah. coming up on his right side, Martial's right side, um, and thus doesn't see Brutus coming in from the other side until it's too late. Brutus does get the ball. Don't get me wrong. The ball mm-hmm. is definitely moved by Brutus twice because yeah. the left foot comes through. Then he passes it with the right foot around Anthony Martial. As fouls go, it was one yeah. of the smoothest. But if you watch <laughs> it, foul and pass. he definitely, I would say definitely, correct me, if you think I'm wrong here. Oh, well. Number one, makes contact with Martial's left leg before he makes contact with the ball. I'd say it's exactly the same time, but okay. the force with which he does it makes it a foul. Right. Yeah. And then that's the second part, is then definitely goes through Martial so that he ends up horizontal. Mm-hmm. And really, even if you get the ball, maybe that's the difference with the commentators, that they think it's a good, proper, old-school challenge, that you get some of the man, you get most of the ball, it's yeah. fine. And for me, it's not. You can't go through the guy's legs to the point where it looked like he... I think you said it looked like uh, Bertos had... 
Marcial is like a marionette almost or something like yeah. that. Have you, like you done that? Have you ever done that thing where you put your arms yeah. to your friend's <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's, and that's move, move like. their hands around like yep. that? Yeah, it looked like he was doing that by like putting his leg through the back of Martial. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I mean, and then obviously Martial doesn't get back up, is mm-hmm. subbed off. So there's clearly a fair amount of contact yeah. there, but no foul given. So we're saying just because you get the ball doesn't mean it's not a foul. Like I could come up to you and tackle you and hit you in the head with a hammer. Right. And I couldn't just be like, well, I got the ball. Yeah. I know I hit him in the head with a hammer, but yeah. look at the I ball. Mean, and also then if you want to go with that route, like, it could just be that you come in two-footed, kick me in the chest, and then you get up and kick the ball away. You're yeah. Like, but no, I ended up with the ball, so it's a fine <laughs> challenge. I got the ball. Like, it doesn't – can't really use that as your argument. I know that's ridiculous because in this situation, he does get the ball as well. But it's, you still can't be reckless in that challenge. And if we're going to give credit, I give mm-hmm. credit to Daryl Yamat yep. for basically – I don't know. I feel like he does a very good job of compartmentalizing yep. and just ignoring all that and mm-hmm. just taking the ball down the wing, cutting it back for good. Yeah, because you and I have both had those sequences where like maybe we can tell the ref doesn't know whose throw in it should be and so yeah, you just yeah. pick it up and throw the ball and it's like, yeah, that's fine, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I do wonder if maybe Yanmat... makes Jan the decision Ma- for him. Yeah, because yeah. I wonder if Yanmat, Ma- if he had stopped and been like, oh, that's obviously a foul, that foul gets given. <laughs> but he picks it up and goes off as though it's like a perfectly clean challenge. Maybe it just helps the referee a little more. Be like, yeah, yeah, that was a fine challenge. And it's a great run from him and it's a great ball to pick out Kapu, who's more or less wide open at the yeah. top of the box. All right, so the next two goals... Yeah. I would argue they get progressively worse for Manchester United. Well, can I say one thing, though? Because I think you're the one who pointed this out, and I thought it was really interesting. So you noted that Shaw overran when Martial cuts back. Yeah, the reason it's, Martial's like, trapped in the corner is right. that yeah, Shaw and Pogba have both gone. Yeah. And we both watched it from like the reverse angle from behind the goal, where you can see the foul occur and then the ball in. And both of us were like, what is Luke Shaw doing? Because he makes that run, and then he like slowly turns and, and then comes back and then starts running. And I think you realized, oh, he thinks it's a foul. Yeah. And so I think a couple of different Man United players are like, oh, that's got to be a foul. It's coming. Yeah. And so they all switch off. And whether or not it is, how many times have we screamed it at our teammates, play till the whistle? Yeah. No whistle given. It means you're not marking. It means they might score. And that's exactly what Watford did. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, but so there's some excuse in a way for that goal, yeah. right? And Manchester United equalize mm-hmm. through Marcus Rashford. A little bit of luck, like it bounces around a bit. And then yeah. Rashford, really nice finish mm-hmm. at the near post. He came on at half time. Um, well done, Marcus. No, sorry, he started the game, didn't he? Uh, he Rashford. Did. Um, the next two goals that Watford score, I think, are all the problems that, well, most of the problems that Jose Mourinho's Manchester United yeah. have. Are I think sort the, of, the second one in particular is, yeah. is indicative of some problems. Okay, so it's Zuniga who mm-hmm. comes off the bench. It's the guy who broke Neymar. I think it's his first touch. Comes yeah. off the bench and scores mm-hmm. um, what, turned, what I guess you'd call it the match winner, mm-hmm. right? But it's really about what happens in the build up to that. Right. Um, so it's Amrabat has the ball. I would go even one step further and say that it all starts with a free kick conceded by Marilyn Fellaini yes. when it doesn't need to be conceded. Yeah, so this is a story of mm-hmm. defensive midfielders, Fellaini and Pogba, mm-hmm. not being good at being defensive midfielders, right? right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Fellaini goes too high, gives away an unnecessary foul. At mid- like around midfield, yeah. Around about midfield, yeah, but it's still unnecessary, right? Yeah. They could have held up play and mm-hmm. won it back. Instead, he just fouls him, yep. right? So what for take it? Um, the ball's coming down the right with Amrabat. Am yep. I pronouncing that correctly? Northern Amrabat. Northern Amrabat. Um, or Nordin, I'm sure it is, but whatever. And it's Pogba who has Pereira, Mm -hmm. who eventually gets the assist, Mm -hmm. right? But instead, Pogba is trying to sort of pass Pereira off to someone else. Mm -hmm. Is it to Fellaini? Is he gesturing to Fellaini? It ends up being Fellaini. I think he's trying to, he sees that Luke Shaw is letting Pereira come inside. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, no, sorry, not Pereira. He's letting uh, Amrabat Amrabat come inside. So Pogba tries to move to, like, block off that avenue. But he does so by leaving his man Pereira yeah. and just kind of gesturing for Fellaini to cover him. It's not, that's the first thing, right? It's not right. enough. It's not like, hey, Marlon Fellaini, mm-hmm. please come and mark this guy. And you're yeah. supposed to really wait until that's definitely happening before yeah. you shuffle over. He sort of does a half gesture mm-hmm. like this, just waving his arm around, and then shuffles left. Doesn't close down the passing lane and doesn't close down his man. Result is Pereira runs in behind, Amrabat finds him. Um, Pereira cuts it back to the now open Zuniga because yep. Fellaini was marking Zuniga and Pogba's pulled him over. Right. He's created all kinds of defensive problems for Manchester United. Right, and it's because that's not where he needs to be playing. Yeah. That's not Pogba's skill suit. He will win challenges, don't get me wrong, and mm-hmm. he'll be physical. But his his game is for Fellaini as well. Yeah, but his game his game being Pogba isn't about being a defensive stalwart who can then, you know, organize the midfield and organize the defense. It's about being a creative playmaker. That's mm-hmm. what he does. And playing him in the back doesn't really help with that. Or playing him in defensive midfield, I think, doesn't really suit that. So, mm-hmm. what is the solution? Like, because clearly Manchester United cannot continue with Marlon Fellaini and Paul Pogba as their two deep midfielders. Nope. Okay, I get that maybe it doesn't work against Manchester City because mm-hmm. Guardiola's Man City, as we'll talk about later, mm-hmm. are terrifying, right? Yep. But if it doesn't work against Feyenoord and it doesn't work against Watford, then maybe you've got to rethink some things. 
I think it especially did – it's because it's not just that that didn't work. It's that Watford clearly like knew what to do. Mm-hmm. They knew to get people back so that, and force Manchester United into doing that sort of slowly passing the ball around. As we saw by the end of the game, it was that same old ball on the left, pass, 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 try to work all the way down to the right, only in this situation yeah. that I remember. The ghost Eric, of Van Hall. Eric Bailly then passes it straight out of bounds. <laughs> yeah. So that's not great. <laughs> but that's why I think – and I, I hesitate to say this because I know it's like the cliche narrative right now. But the most logical solution in my mind is to drop Wayne Rooney and you put Paul Pogba as a number 10. Because what that game needed, I think, is a stronger defensive midfield, obviously, but also a player like Pogba who can charge forward with the ball and try to create something and try to pick out those passes or those little Aaron Johansson-esque chips (laughs) instead of moving the ball slowly. And I do think that's been a lot of the criticism lobbed at Wayne Rooney, and I do agree with that aspect of it, that it is a little bit slow, it's a little bit uh, too determined. Funny you should mention that, mm-hmm. Tyler. We had a question emailed to us by yeah. Chris Bentley about exactly this. And I know you know this question's mm-hmm. coming. Um, Chris says... Actually, I legitimately forgot, so <laughs> thank you for remembering. Sorry, Chris, Chris says that, generally, I agree with your guys' analysis, but I don't see how you guys believe Wayne Rooney is still at or even near his best. He looks slow and seems to run out of gas before 90 minutes. His first touch is quite bad. Watching United, as I do, parentheses, a fan, mm-hmm. possession often stops with him giving the ball away. He also often drifts into other player spaces, causing an imbalance between attack and midfield. Mm-hmm. What position does he play? Would United be better off with Mata, a true number 10, in the number 10 role what do you guys see that i'm missing daryl i'll let you take that why me because i think you have a a more favorable opinion of wayne rooney than i do or at least i think that you think he's unfairly maligned yeah it kind of becomes the focal point of hate is that maybe that's that's a bit too harsh no that's i I think that's exactly it so um to take chris's question believe he's still at or even near his best. I don't think he's at his best because his best was when he was very young and he had that acceleration mm-hmm. to kind of drive at people and yeah, bang I think there's, there's no, distance. I think there's no argument about that, and that's part of what I'm getting at is yeah. but Paul Pogba has that, that ability to drive. When so, well, let's get to the Pogba versus sure, Rooney sure, sure. Uh, mm-hmm. comparison yeah. later. Um, I, I still think he has a lot to offer a team. He has a skill set that I think is kind of undervalued. And I also think when things aren't working on the Manchester United team, and it is like Pogba and Fellaini's defensive midfield work to blame, for example... I still think Rooney gets the bulk of the blame because he's the target that people go for first. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Well, we're the, we've you know built ourselves many times as a show that asks why. So I'm going to ask you to be specific. What is the skill set that you think he offers that no one else can offer? Because I don't know if I agree with that sentiment. So I think it's his passing. I honestly think Wayne Rooney is a magnificent passer of the ball and picks out incredible passes, right? Mm-hmm. And here's the thing. I noticed on Reddit someone had com- combined the or compiled the worst of, of Wayne Rooney – versus Watford Mm -hmm. I think I've hit on what's happening because to me it's not worth the more interesting conversation isn't is Rooney suddenly terrible or not it's more like why isn't it quite working because I'm not Mm going to say he had a great game he had a poor game against Watford so many crosses went high and far Mm -hmm. right I think he has been instructed lift that ball high and far Mm -hmm. because every time he does it there's Zlatan and Pogba and Fellaini at the far post, kind of like the um, the goal that United score against Manchester City in the Manchester mm-hmm. derby. Remember, he lifts that ball high and Bravo comes and flaps at it and it ends up with Latan scoring. Mm-hmm. I think that's what he's been instructed to do. He's been instructed to hang the ball up as much as possible. Did he play that ball in? I can't remember. He did. He okay. played that free kick in, yeah. Um, okay. And he lifted it very, very high. I've had that game more or less professionally scrubbed from my memory, so <laughs> I, I can't remember. It's a not sunshine style. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I mean, I don't necessarily disagree with that. And I think like what he will always be super good at is that sort of Hollywood ball mm-hmm. where it's a f- like 40 50 yard cross field hit with pace hit with power that drops perfectly into someone's path yeah he can definitely do that but that seems to be those moments seem to be few and far between in my opinion and it's a lot like i think he can still make those passes as well when united break but mm-hmm. when it's a slow build up and he has to really find those passes quickly i don't think he excels there and i think he takes an extra touch and slows things down and i think gets himself into trouble and when he does rush i think that's where you see him cross the ball straight out of bounds But do you get my point that what he's going for, he's been instructed, I think, to hang that ball up at the far post. And essentially, if anything, Wayne Rooney's um, problem is that he's sort of doing what he's told. He keeps trying that ball. No, see, I I guess I don't agree with you because I think maybe when he gets deployed as a winger, as he did later on in this game, maybe that's the case then, as it is the case with maybe the other wingers. But that's not where he's usually playing. He's usually playing underneath Zlatan. And I can't imagine that if he is playing as the number 10 or underneath a support striker that his job is to then take the ball wide and cross it in. Well, he does roam, that's the thing, right? He roams around. And maybe mm-hmm. that's part of what Chris is talking about, where he creates an imbalance. Because mm-hmm. he does, I noticed in the, in the first like, 10 minutes of that game, he would drift 
mm-hmm. to the right or to the left. And I mm-hmm. think he thinks he's making an overload, but maybe he's just getting in the way. Yeah, that yeah, that could be. I, I do think, I think people are right to be frustrated with him. I, yeah. I agree with that. I don't think that he is the you know, and you get rid of him and everything will click immediately. I think that's still the thing. A lot of work to be I done. think he could easily be removed from this team, and things are just as bad. Mm-hmm. Although, okay, so the flip side is, I do want to talk about this. If Pogba played in that number ten role, mm-hmm. which isn't really his role, what would it look like? Um. Because normally I mean, he's been part of like a three-man midfield, right? Mm-hmm. But with a holding midfielder, so he's got room to yeah. go and go and go. Yeah. And, and I think that's what a lot of people thought would happen this season. And yeah. obviously it's not what United have gone for. But I think it suits his game better than being a defensive midfielder. Yeah. Um, and if that's what Jose Mourinho is going to do is go with a 4-2-3-1, which is what it seems like he's sticking with, then I think attacking midfield makes sense with Pogba because he is that big player who can get in the box and, and kind of help out with Zlatan and winning the headers if they're going to continue to pump them into the box. Mm-hmm but also can drive at people and try to make something happen. And I think has the pace and the kind of explosive creativity that a young Wayne Rooney had to really be like, all right, we're passing it around. I'm going to go at somebody and try to make something happen. Yeah. And I don't see Rooney doing that nearly as much anymore. So who do Manchester United play next? Uh, I believe it is Leicester at home. Oh, that's an interesting game. It is. Leicester and just I, won as well. And I want to say, an inter- like heading into that, one other point I wanted to make, though, is I, I will say I'm not – not trying to be, like, way reactionary, just saying that out front. But I think there is, and I'll say it from experience, that as soon as United started losing this game, third straight game in a row, I had that momentary, like, oh, no. Like, is this is it happening again? Like, it happened with Moyes, it happened with Van Hall. And I had that momentary kind of panic. And I do wonder if maybe there are other Manchester United fans out there who don't want to, like, have complete faith in Jose Mourinho to figure stuff out. And so... They've got to put the blame on somebody, and so it's Wayne Rooney, or so it's Maron Fellaini, until those guys get switched. You don't want to blame Mourinho. Exactly. And I think there is that element to it as well. Not saying he should be sacked, not saying there's any reason really to worry about it, other than that United have looked a little bit stagnant. Well, I mean, yeah, if you're looking for blame, you could look at the third goal. You could blame yep. Ashley Young. You could blame Eric Bailly for like two of the worst tackles oh, I've seen in a gracious. long time. I mean, yeah. He slides in and it would have been a red card challenge if he'd been even close to connecting with yeah. the ball or the man. Yeah, and said uh, success gets past him, gets past Young, gets past Bailly again, who tries yeah. to like... It, at that point, it seems like tries to concede a penalty. Uh-huh. And, he's not, and he's not strong enough. Success gets away from him and then gets fouled by Fellaini. Then Fellaini draws concedes a penalty, a penalty yeah. yeah. Uh, which Troy Deeney scores, mm-hmm. makes it 3-1. I yep. think we'll just have to uh, see... If Mourinho rings the changes against Leicester, yeah. my guess is he will. I think he'll shake things up in one way or another. We shall maybe Pogba at number 10. Maybe a whole new shape. Mm-hmm. Maybe a whole new shape where you have three central midfielders. 11 David De Gea's. 11 David De Gea's. Yeah, yes, that's what I'm going for. Oh, there's a whole separate conversation about De Gea's foot saves in this game, but I feel like we have to save it because we could go in circles. I like, I like the idea of saving it, yeah. <laughs> I'd still be right at the end, by the way. <laughs> sure. I'm sure that you think that you would. Taylor, today's show is sponsored by the good people at Mac Weldon. This is true. Mac Weldon, makers of quality men's wear. It is better than what you're wearing right now. Unless you're wearing Mac Weldon. I, I am wearing oh, Mac Weldon. I can't say that to you then. <laughs> Anyone out there who's not wearing Mac Weldon, it's better than what you're wearing right now. Parts of what I'm wearing are Mac Weldon, parts of it are not, and therefore it's better than parts of what I'm wearing. It's equal to parts of what I'm wearing as well. So Mac Weldon is the sponsor of our Premier League mm-hmm. coverage. Um, as part of this, we usually do the Mac Weldon Player of the Week, but we both agree, right? There's no debate. No, it's Kevin De Bruyne. It's Kevin De Bruyne. <laughs> yeah. So in Man City's 4-0 win over Bournemouth, mm-hmm. Kevin De Bruyne scores the first goal, has indirect assists on two goals, and a direct assist on the fourth goal. Mm-hmm. So he's involved in all the goals. And we know uh, Mac Weldon ma- are also makers of antimicrobial clothing, which uh-huh. makes you not stink. Kevin De Bruyne was the did not stink player of the week. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> he was quite good. A goal, a goal, a beautiful goal that might be a nominee for goal of the week, uh-huh. which is what I think we're going to do instead, yeah. right? Yeah, Kevin De Bruyne made Bournemouth stink. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, we have a few picks for goal of the week. Let's start with that Kevin De Bruyne first goal then. Sure, and it might, I'm going to say this out front, it might be my winner because it's a beautiful free kick that he very clearly intentionally plays under the wall. Yeah. Uh, so the Bournemouth wall, all of them jump, yeah. and he puts it right underneath their outstretched feet and into the back of the net. How does he know? Because I'm going to guess footage, that they've watched enough film to know if you have a wall from this like distance away, yeah. the Bournemouth wall jumps. And Because reason- normally you would try and bend it up into the top corner, so yeah. normally you jump to try and block that. Right. Yeah. And I think the reason why it's so great, aside from the fact that it's you know a clearly intentional finish, uh, is that... 
rarely do you get that many players looking just so disconsolate. But because they're all on the wall, they all when they all land, they just turn, and then all of them just look so forlorn yeah. that it makes it that much more like humiliating for them and awe-inspiring for him. Oh, and the, the other three goals are breaks where De Bruyne is absolutely orchestrating the counterattack in a way that is absolutely unstoppable. Yeah, here, here's the one that then it's like one of them is Sterling to Iannaccio in the end, and then the other one is him to Iannaccio to Sterling. So they all <laughs> they all have a bit of a combination going on. <laughs> all right, another nominee for goal yep. of the week is Granite Shaka's late goal. It's the icing yep. on the cake of Arsenal's 4-1 win over Hull City. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what the distance is, but it's pushing 40 yards. It, it, it's far. It's pushing field goal range. It's real far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he just winds up, I believe it's left-footed, right in the top corner. But it's it's right in the top corner, but that makes it just sound like, oh, he put it in the top corner. But it's the distance combined with just the way it looks, because mm-hmm. it's this will not make any sense, but... He hits so hard that it looks slow because everything around <laughs> yeah. him like slows down kind of because it's so fast and well, it just careens into the back of the net. The whole city midfield and defense yeah. slowed down because you can see them all sort of. Yeah. They see Shaka gets the ball and I think they think, oh, he's kind of a defensive midfielder. It's okay. Mm-hmm. And they sort of back off waiting for him to try and find a pass into the area, mm-hmm. right? Just thinking, okay, we'll just get numbers behind the ball. But they back off so much. He, he's like, all right, you're going to give me room. <laughs> I'm going to shoot. It's real pretty, but it was not the only goal from distance this week and probably not the only goal from distance nominee. So we have to talk Jordan Henderson. This goal happened while we were in studio on Friday um, and we we caught it on TV. We went to happy hour with our friends, all of whom declared it to be the goal of the season already. Yeah. It will win goal of the season, say they. There's definitely a recency bias there, but Jordan Henderson's goal... Oh, you think? (laughs) Jordan Henderson's goal from distance um, against Chelsea. Yeah. It was pretty. It looks uh, yeah. like it's going over. This is what happens, right? He hits yeah. it with his right foot. It really does look like it's going over, and then it just dips, dips mm-hmm. into that top right corner, right almost at the last second. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and we, we it, figured out how he did it. Yeah, as well. so Shaka's goal is on a rope. Like, it is yeah. a straight laser beam. <laughs> this one is a looping laser beam. It is. It's definitely still hit with pace. Um, I'll say the way he gets the bend on it is because he does, like, just the perfect hit it low and then get your foot around it really fast. Yeah, yeah. You swing your foot around so you get that spin on it. So you definitely get that obviously hits it with a good amount of power, so that's why he can get the, the dramatic bend. But I think another reason why he's able to do so is something that you spotted. Yeah, so he does a good job to control it and mm-hmm. bring it down, but he doesn't kill it dead. And so the ball is still bouncing ever so slightly. Mm-hmm. So he actually hits it as the ball's bouncing up on the rise, mm-hmm. which means you can get right sort of under it. You know sweet what I mean? spot. You can hit that sweet spot so that it whoo, mm-hmm. dips down at the last second. Ronaldo is somehow capable of finding this sweet spot um, when he yeah. places it for a free kick. I think the sound effect you just made is probably accurate. For what, what noise that ball made? Yeah. <laughs> That's what the Chelsea defenders heard. Yep. <laughs> That's what Courtois heard. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and I can't tell how deliberate, like, Henderson judges the bounce. Or if this is one of those professional soccer player sort of intuition type things where he just so. knows that there's a way to hit this. I think he knows there's, no, there's a way to hit it. He's definitely spotted the fact that he can aim for that side yeah. of the goal, that corner of the goal. But you don't think if you could see inside his head, if it was like Sherlock, you know, and you see what Sherlock's yeah. thinking, if yeah. you, you wouldn't see like the calculations happening of hitting it on the bounce. No, I don't He's think not, so. But Jordan Henderson is not the Benedict Cumberbatch of, uh, of shots from distance. I don't think so. I think especially because I'm not sure Sherlock loves him some physics. So Is that I'm, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know, no, that's astrology. He doesn't like astrology and astronomy. So well, I mean, never mind then. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to give my thoughts on astrology. <laughs> um, and weirdly, it's the one thing my wife and I disagree on vehemently. Yeah, I think we, I think my wife and I have the same <laughs> situations. Uh, and I think usually we go with the rule of three, right? When we're compiling a list of the three nominees or the nominees for best preference? goal. No, no, I'm oh, just saying okay. that you and I, yeah, well, you know, when you're writing, you do a list of three. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that's all of rhetoric ever, but yes. Right, <laughs> but I think we're adding a fourth, and I think this one is slightly hipster, and I think it was your slightly hipster nomination. So it's the other Liverpool goal. Yep. Um, it's Lovren, mm-hmm. and it's because of the clever, quick free, t- free kick yep. that Liverpool take. Yep. So, yeah, Chelsea are lining up to defend a free kick that they think is going to be crossed in. Ish. Instead, they're ish lining up. Yeah, but they're yeah. just getting ready. Instead, yeah. Liverpool, I can't remember who plays it actually, send the ball quickly down the line, allows a cross to come in, and all the Liverpool players drift, not all of them, but like four, I want to say, Liverpool players, yeah. drift to the right hand side. Mm-hmm. So, if you just see this goal in isolation, it looks like all the Chelsea players forgot to mark any of the Liverpool players. Which they did. I mean, (laughs) yes, but only because Liverpool players made this happen. And it's a finish from Lovren. Yeah, because, I mean, you could even watch on the, like, more extended highlight, 
if you can find it, you'll see that after the foul is conceded, Bronislav Ivanovic, it's like a close-up of him because I guess he's the one who did the foul. Yeah. He's like running back towards goal and talking to Diego Costa, who's yeah. also running towards goal. And they, they both, got time for a chat, And then they right? both turn and like, oh, ball's in play, and it cuts back to the ball already <laughs> in play. So I think Chelsea are getting back to do their, like, their line so they can hold the offside line, get their marks, and get ready. And instead, they're scrambling, which is why... Liverpool players are on side, which is why no one notices that there are four, because it's almost like they didn't get into position, and then they launched their, oh, we better go defend this free kick, and forgot yeah. that there were four guys back there. The only one who kind of didn't is David Luiz, yeah. but he only marks one, and doesn't right. really make much more effort than that. And just to wrap all this together, mm-hmm. speaking of Sherlock, this was a piece of master set-piece theatre. <laughs> I think so, too. Yeah. So well done to Liverpool. So now we have yeah. to choose a goal of the week. Hmm. A Mack Weldon goal of the week. Yes. I think... As much as I would like to give it to Kevin De Bruyne, I'm going to give it to Jordan Henderson. I think you talked me into it because he reads the bounce, he gets the angle right, he picks his spot, he finishes from open play. It's very impressive. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you. Right. Jordan Henderson is the Mack Weldon Goal of the Week winner. Mm-hmm. I feel like we should send him something, but I think he's got enough money. I think I, think I wouldn't mind sending him some Mack Weldon attire, but I think he can purchase <laughs> it himself. And he can do so by using the, t- the Total Soccer Show discount code. Oh yeah, if Jordan Henderson needs 20% off uh-huh. at MacWeldon.com, he can use discount code TSS mm-hmm. for 20% off at MacWeldon.com. M-A-C-K-W-E-L-D-O-N dot com. You can also find the link and that coupon code in the show notes. I still recommend the V-neck T-shirts. It's my favorite. And <laughs> really? the polo that Taylor's wearing right now. Yep. I'm a fan of the polo. I'm, I'm a big fan of the polo. We again had a moment this weekend where I wore the polo to our Kickers game. Yep. We did the commentary for Kickers defeat, 2-1 defeat to Charleston mm-hmm. Battery. I think, oh, I just realized we'll talk about this in a minute, right? Well, we'll talk about it yes, but no, okay. because we're recording two shows back to back. Okay, yeah, we'll talk about this on the next show. Yes. But yeah, you sh- I showed up in my Mac Weldon uh-huh. uh, shirt and was very relieved that you weren't. I assumed that you would show up in your Mac Weldon <laughs> shirt, and thus I did not wear my own. Yes. <laughs> Oh, we are insufferable. Yep, pretty much. <laughs> thank you to Mac Weldon for sponsoring today's episode. And thank you to everyone who chose to become a Total Soccer Show subscriber. Oh, yes. Because mm-hmm, we have some uh, some updates to the, to the Total Soccer Show scouting network. So on the show, we're going to have three updates to the Total Soccer Show scouting network. This is where um, our listeners go out and track the hottest young talents in soccer. Keep an eye on them for us and let us know what's going on. They're so on. hot right now. <laughs> uh, up first is Hall McGee scouting Timo Werner. I'm going to go with that since I'm... Sounds you know, right. Yeah, playing the Bundesliga, I feel like it's right. 20-year-old forward for RB Leipzig, long ball sport Leipzig, is that correct? <laughs> yes. Um, this weekend, uh, Leipzig wonderkind and TSS scouty Timo Werner poured on the coals to grill Hamburg. <laughs> well done, Hall. Uh, Werner came on as a second-half sub and quickly won a penalty, which was converted by his teammate. But then he went on to score a brace of his own. So involved in three goals was young Mr. Werner. And a 4-0 win. Leipzig. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're doing surprisingly well in the Bundesliga, and I think a lot of people are not very happy about it. Yeah. I'm no math major, but I'm going to say he was involved in 75% of their goals. Good job, buddy. Thanks, buddy. Linda Larson mm-hmm. has emailed. She is scouting Callum Slattery, the 17-year-old centre midfielder for Southampton's under-18s. Here's what Linda says about Callum. He has been out with a vaguely categorized knee injury since Linda started scouting him. Mm-hmm. However, he's now back playing for Southampton's U18s and scored a great goal against Villa's U18s. Mm-hmm. Have Linda, you seen said goal? I have not, but I enjoyed Linda's analysis of, based on the length of the injury combined with how everybody wasn't really talking about it, but he continued to be out, she's diagnosed it as an ACL injury. That's what she's decided. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Linda Larson, yes. MD. And thank you, Ryan Marzak, who's scouting up. Uh, I'm going to say Pione. I think I've been mispronouncing this the entire time. Pione okay. Sisto. Okay. 21-year-old Danish winger for Celta de Vigo. Uh, Sisto appeared in both games for Celta Vigo uh, this past week. But Ryan reports that the highlight was seeing his name in the starting 11 for the Europa League match against Standard Liège. I imagine that is really exciting because we have that with Christian Pulisic. Yeah. Like every time, whenever he starts, we get the updates, we get excited. Uh-huh. And if it's your scout, I guess you probably get pretty pumped too. Yep. Um, Ryan concludes that the early signs are that Sisto will continue to feature prominently for Celta this season. Okay. Oh, speaking of Pulisic, Mm -hmm. Wendy Thomas is still doing a great job of letting us know Mm -hmm. every time her special sunflower (laughs) starts a game or does anything for Borussia Dortmund. (laughs) Thank you, Wendy. Yep. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, everyone, who sent in some uh, updates. We'll have more on the next show. Oh, yeah. If you would like to join the Top Soccer Show Scouting Network, here's how you do it. You go to totalsoccershow.com slash subscribe. And then what? And then all the information is there. And then you can choose to subscribe at $5, 10 15 20 $25 a month. And then we'll give you an exciting young player to scout. If you have signed up and have not received your player, 
and you're getting impatient, maybe your feet are a little itchy, email us and say, itchy feet, and let us know that you want your scout now. We will get to it as soon as possible. You know, I think it was this broadcast, I think it was the Wednesday broadcast from last week where I realized that rope a like that, uh, the Muhammad Ali strategy mm-hmm. comes from, like, legitimately calling George Foreman a dope is uh-huh. what that means. I, it occurs to me, I've never really thought about why we call it itchy feet. Why have you gone with itchy feet? Do you not have that? This may be a very, like, a Britishism type uh-huh. thing, but, like, if you are um, raring to go somewhere, uh-huh. you say, people say you have itchy feet. Because, like, if you're, like, you know, like jiggling in your chair, like, and your feet are moving because you don't want to be sitting still anymore, you want to go do it. Yeah. Itchy feet. I feel like usually in the United States, it means John Act- John Madden is trying to sell you Tenactin or <laughs> animated uh, creatures are burrowing into your feet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but in this case, it yeah. means you want to know who your scouting gotcha. is. Gotcha. <laughs> All right, Taylor. Uh, thank you yep. for taking the time to talk to me today. I've, you battled well through that Man United segment. Well done, buddy. Oh, it was real fun. It was real fun. <laughs> uh, right back at you. But it will never be as bad as when... Uh, Josh, Peyton, and Albert, our friends and former co-hosts. Uh, I promised them all that I would DVR the Liverpool Man United game for them so that they could watch it later on. So they came over to my house to watch it, and I got to rewatch the three 0 drubbing courtesy of Dirk Coit. Oh, mm-hmm. that was oh. real fun. And since we're talking about our teams, yeah. uh, worth noting, yeah. uh, Wolves went away to Newcastle this weekend. My team, Wolves, went to play DeAndre Yedlin's Newcastle. Wolves won 2-0. Mm-hmm. You, are you, you squinting at DeAndre Yedlin's Newcastle? Yep. <laughs> Yedlin did not play. But here's what happened. Anita, the midfielder who has been playing right back for Newcastle, got himself sent off. Mm-hmm. So that means there is a pathway to the team for DeAndre Yedlin. All right, listeners, thank you for taking the time to listen. We'll be back very soon with another show, which will be focused on the Toronto versus New York Red Bulls um, MLS game. Look forward to talking to you then. <laughs>